Our time on Earth is a remarkable odyssey from birth to death. But could there be something more, something beyond what we can see or hear or touch? Religion describes a world without end, now and forever. While cosmologists look to the stars and contemplate the fantastic logic of eternity. See the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. William Blake's paradoxical lines always come to mind when I think of eternity, as do biblical phrases like everlasting life, forever and ever, amen. Eternity is also found throughout popular culture in music, romantic songs, movies. Eternity, depending on what you believe, has many meanings and connotations. For millions of people the world over, religious and spiritual teachings promise an afterlife, heaven, paradise, nirvana. While we also have astrophysical theories that posit endless time and infinite space. All of the people that went were test pilots. In the beginning, we were all test pilots. We'd flown machinery, uh, all sorts of aircraft. So we were just extending our experience in aircraft into the next step. Uh, you're doing something new. So there is an undercurrent of excitement of the explorer. We were a group of professionals uh, doing a job that we decided to do. And in this particular case, it was go where humans hadn't been before. Apollo 14 was bound for the moon. But Edgar Mitchell, though he didn't know it yet, was also embarked on an inner journey, one that would change the way he thought about life and God, and that elusive concept of time and space and belief that we label eternity. Why do we bother with an idea like eternity, letting it churn up emotions like love, awe, and even fear? What is eternity? And in or out of this world, what is the appeal of contemplating forever? It's a, a humiliation for us to think that we are just one of the uncountable, anonymous creatures that is born, reproduces, and dies. What is eternity? Well, it's not sequential time. It, it's like an eternal moment that never, ever ends. Eternity, if you think of it as just time going on and on, is a meaningless concept because if nothing is going to be happening in the future, it's going to be the same thing as being dead. We want some kind of solidity. We want to be irrevocably part of the universe. This is what, he, what we want when we seek the eternal. But can we ever achieve it? Like many people, I'd love to believe there's more to this world than I can see and feel around me. Something extraordinary something eternal existing outside ourselves, a credible concept beyond images, poetry, and paradox. The way that uh, eternity has evolved as a concept in the West has been from a personal perspective. What's my, my place in all this? And the answer is, of course, living things have some kind of soul. Thinking, conscious things have some kind of extra special soul. And humans, who are so terribly clever, must have you know, the best kind of soul of all. Am I in, in some way different from a rock or this animal over here? If you believe that you have a soul, then that soul, by its nature, is just going to survive your body. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is die. All you have to do is die and by physically dying, you then free up the real you to live on eternally. So forever is a religious abstraction, a story wholly dependent on faith. Uh, but is this the kind of storytelling where the rational mind wages war with the emotions and the spirit, where the concept of eternity can also adhere to the known laws of physics? 
I think that there's no question that eternity is plausible as part of a scientific account of the world. Uh, scientists will debate or at least wonder, is the universe something that lasts forever in time? Is it something that uh, had a beginning, will have an end? And you know, the honest answer is right now, we certainly don't know the answer. When Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, and he goes backwards and forwards, as you know, to the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, it's the way heaven wants the earth. Heaven is the dream of God, the vision of God, the hope of God for the earth. And I think that's one of the biggest differences between the, the Christian eternity and some of these very far out, difficult to accept eternities being proposed by astrophysicists, is that the, the you know, back to the beginning, the self, me, am I going to exist forever? The Christian eternity answer is yes. And it's just, you know, you're you, there is no other you and you are going to live forever. Yet deep down, we all know our time on this earth is finite. So is thinking about eternity simply a way of calming our fears about our own mortality? There is a paradox in the way that we view death. Because on the one hand, we see death all around us. We know that all people die eventually. But on the other hand, we can't really conceive of ourselves not existing. And so there's this tension within our view of death. Death seems obvious and yet impossible. There were 13.7 billion years since the Big Bang up until I came into existence. Why did I, you know, why did I have to wait so long? I don't know. But suddenly here I am existing. Um, so the best I can hope for is to keep existing forever. How it got to be you and not somebody else is just a miracle for every single one of us. It's a total miracle. I mean, you can just calculate what a miracle it is. Your mother had, say, 300 eggs, okay? Your father, 100 million sperm per ejaculation. So every single time your parents had sex, there could have been billions of different children, and you got it. You hit the lottery. It was you. Now, to ask for a second chance to be exactly the same person means that you've missed the point of how rare you are. You cannot appreciate how wonderful and rare you are if you're always looking forward to, can I come back, can I come back? We have this will to live that the animals have, but we have this consciousness of death at the same time because of our mighty intellects. And this is a terrible position to be in, this is a curse. We want to live, and yet we, we can see death coming. And how do we solve this? By dreaming of eternity. What happens to us and where do we go after we've shuffled off this mortal coil? Seems we've been dreaming about life beyond the grave for thousands of years. One of the oldest representations of eternity, which is predates most religions, is the snake swallowing its tail. The Euroboros is what the Greeks called it. And that has sort of become the de facto symbol for eternity linking East and West because it links kind of uh, Eastern Asian concepts of eternity as cyclical and um, Western notions of eternity as a single thing. So these stories that promise us eternity are fundamental parts of every world culture and civilization. Some do it better than others. Ancient Egypt, for example, did it best of all. Now, we're talking here about a civilization that lasted for at least 3,000 years, was prosperous and successful. As civilizations go, it was gold star. And a huge amount of their time and energy and wealth was invested in the immortality industry. These were people who were very serious about achieving eternity. Biblical traditions have deep roots in ancient Egypt but also in Mesopotamia, the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, what we now call Syria and Iraq. The oldest story in the world is from Mesopotamia, and it's about our longing for eternity. The Epic of Gilgamesh begins with two friends seeking favor from the gods, but before long, tragedy strikes. Gilgamesh's friend dies. Now at first, Gilgamesh 
is mourning his friend, but then he realizes, well, hang on, if my friend, this hugely strong character, can die, well, maybe I can die. I, the king, was the great hero. Maybe I can die too. And he starts tearing his hair out and tearing his clothes off, and he goes into the wilderness, and from then on, he's on a quest for immortality. And Gilgamesh succeeds. He finds a plant that bestows eternal life, but he sets it down for a moment to bathe his wounds. A serpent appears, steals the plant, and Gilgamesh is left to weep at the futility of his quest. The Mesopotamians didn't believe in eternity. When they told the story that Gilgamesh um, was given the plant of eternity and immediately lost it, they weren't telling you, wow, if he just hadn't taken that swim, he'd have held on to it. They were telling you he could never have had it. That he had it for a minute and lost it is simply a dramatic way of saying, never could. It's interesting that the emotional need for eternal life, or for an afterlife at least, you know, partly arises from the perception that uh, here on this earth, there are some bad people who are getting away with murder, and there's some good people who are suffering a lot, and this injustice has to be rectified. Eternity and goodness and justice in the West have always been very tightly wound around each other as concepts. You begin to have um, detailed descriptions of the afterlife, which culminate in, in the Italian poet Dante's Divine Comedy, where he actually takes a tour of hell, purgatory, and heaven. It could just be enough of an afterlife for the wicked to be punished and the good to be rewarded, and then someone turns the switch off. I would actually be happy with that. I've lived a very good life, and I'm not being rewarded. But, um, yeah, and then there's the, 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 the idea that, that um, your, one's consciousness is so precious, and one's self is so precious, that the, eye of it, the idea of it being extinguished is too painful to contemplate, um, even if we're suffering. It seems to be human not to want to die. I certainly don't. And if somebody can persuade you that you really don't die, you just move to another room, that's kind of lovely. I certainly think that it's worth asking about whether we have an afterlife and having the prospects of it, because this can help you to get through day-to-day -day living. And it can certainly comfort you if you think about people who you love who have died, prospects of meeting them again. I, I think it's useful to examine this, to see whether there might be reasonable grounds for believing it. Reasonable cause for belief may be found in the phenomenon known as a near-death experience. Tens of thousands of people report having an NDE, and the stories they tell are remarkably consistent, strongly suggesting that something lies beyond. I was sitting on the edge of the bed and I was talking to him and as I'm having this conversation with him, all of a sudden his head drops, his eyes are open. And, you know, you could have put your hand in front of him and then he stops engaging with me. And so I stopped for a minute and I sat on the edge of the bed and I waited for a bit in silence. And then all of a sudden he came up and he looked around the room and then he looked at me, sort of surprised I was on the bed. And so we started a dialogue again, and then stopped again. Raggedy Ann, eyes open, nothing, I could have done this, no engagement. And I waited again, about two or three minutes later came back. And that happened about three or four times. And then finally, as he came back about the fourth time, I said, you know, I think I'm gonna need a pair of lead boots to keep you in that body. And he said, <laughs> He, he apologized, actually. He said, oh, I'm sorry. And I said, I got playful. I said, are you kidding me? If it was me and I was off exploring the heavens or doing something, I would just go off and see what was happening. And he got really quiet. It's the interesting thing. He's still afraid to be judged a bit. He looked around the room. He looked out in the hallway and he looked at me because he didn't want anyone to hear this. And he said, people used to tell me that I could be in one place and my body could be somewhere else. But he said, I didn't believe it until now. 
I just watched in fascination and I slowly sank to the bottom. And I found myself, I'll never forget, on my knees in the mud in this pond, running my hands through these colors and thinking, oh my God, I didn't know you could feel colors. And the colors would penetrate right through my body and I could feel like purple and orange and gold and, and the different vibrations in my body. And it just seemed so incredible and so strange. And I began to think, wow, maybe I'm dead. Playing with his cousins on the prairies, 12-year-old Paul Elder fell into a pond and almost drowned. It was his first awareness of his own mortality. The only reference I'd ever had to death or dying, I didn't even know anybody who died, was <laughs> my memory locked on to this book, Tom Sawyer, that I had read just a few weeks before this. It's a part where Tom is believed to have drowned in the Mississippi or something, and he returns home in time for his own memorial service. And with that thought, the most incredible thing happened. I, or who I perceived to be me, went shooting out of the water. And in an instant, I'm floating over the Catholic church or in over the choir loft in the back of our Catholic church out in the country. Floating and looking down over this huge church that was empty. And I'm thinking to myself, well, if this is my funeral, where is everybody? And when you're 12 years old and something weird happens like that, you go, that was weird, and you go on with life. Make another slingshot, get in trouble, right? And life just keeps, you know, keeps happening. I didn't realize how that had changed me at the time in significant ways. I mean, I thought it was just me without really knowing it or realizing it, um, began to see the world in a different way. I think I was close to falling into a, a, a deeper darkness than I'd ever experienced because there was a point uh, when I was going through my traumas that I was too exhausted and I, I felt even then, and I know now, I could have just let go. I could have just said, it's, it's too tiring, I just don't want it anymore. But like any storyteller, I wanted to find out what, what happens next, so I kind of hung around. Wayson Choi is a Canadian writer who, in 2001, suffered a double trauma, a severe asthma attack followed by cardiac arrest. His critically praised memoir, Not Yet, recounts his subsequent adventures in the hospital and in another dimension. I lay calmly even when there appeared, right behind the glowing outline of the medical team working over me, a gaunt, hooded rider astride a moon-pale horse. The skeletal rider boldly stood up on silver stirrups, crooked his bony index finger to bid me mount. Well, the first thing to say about near-death experiences is that for the people who have them, these are extremely meaningful, real experiences, and often life-changing experiences. But the question is, how do we interpret them? How do we make sense of them? The ghostly sight startled me. But then my literary instincts twigged to it all. Aha, the classic symbol for Cervantes' father death. I see a pale horse, pale rider, cried madly saying Don Quixote, and he bids me mount. Identified, horse and rider vanished, but my mind played on and we have to interpret them within the broader context of what we understand about the world and the universe and the way it works. Now, what we have here is literally the most complex thing in the known universe, that is a human brain being starved of oxygen. Near-death experiences are very much like periods of extreme stress, exhaustion, uh, drug use, mental um, damage and stuff like that. And things, we can clearly map things that happen in the brain. In fact, you can actually solve equations to show why we tend to see tunnels that go off into a light, you know, when the brain, when the visual cortex is uh, not being stimulated, but it's sort of just vibrating all by itself. That's a very natural thing to end up seeing. So it's just the least surprising thing in the world that uh, our brains would organize things into sort of a different kind of sets of visions when you are near death, right? That's exactly what you would expect. The neural circuitry, as it's 
falling apart, is firing in weird ways, and so we're getting, uh, we're not having veridical perception of the external world. We're seeing a sort of a private light show or a private fireworks show. Uh, the mistake, the only mistake, would be to think that, well, I felt like I was part of a bigger reality and therefore I conclude on the basis of this evidence that the physical reality around me is not all that there exists. And there are people I've met who've had near-death experiences and when they come to the end of their life, calmer a lot of times because there's a knowing in there. It's not from a textbook. They have a knowing in here that helps them to feel more comfortable in the transition. Why do we need to close off the probability that there's anything our brain can't perceive? Because if, if you are a pure materialist and you think our brain is an evolutionary product uh, for survival, no matter how clever we are, how much we can figure out the material universe, what if there's more? I've always thought there were all kinds of levels of realities. And, uh, you know, when you're half asleep, when you're awake, those are demonstrations that, that uh, insights come to you in different ways that your consciousness cannot understand. So I'm not surprised that uh, there might be certainly more than what the eye and the ears can normally hear or see. As a good scientist, the first thing I have to say is that I could be wrong. I could be wrong about lots of things. I could be a brain in a vat. You could not exist, right? I could be being taunted by an evil demon who is giving me hallucinations. There's plenty of things that are possible. I need to decide on the basis of the world that I see what is the best understanding that I have of it. After many, many experiences, um, several near-death experiences and many, many hundreds of out-of-body experiences, I've come to an understanding of what I think about God and eternity. And I think that we are all individuated aspects of the Creator whoever that is, whatever that is, and that each of us collectively, as one consciousness, forms one consciousness, we are the creators. Whenever we try to imagine the future, or forever, we unavoidably come up against one of the core mysteries of eternal logic, the ubiquitous everyday puzzle that we call time. Most people, and I think they follow Newton in this, would think of time as being something like a, an invisible river which just flows on and it's carrying us ever further from the past and into the future. And, and somehow we pass a mark and that's sort of now and then there's another now and we keep on coming into new nows. Einstein came around to the view that um, the world really is four-dimensional in its existence, and that means, for example, that what happened in the past is still existing back there along the fourth dimension. In a way, this is very encouraging. I mean, I, I really loved my father, and I'm glad that it's quite possible that he hasn't been wiped out of existence in an, any absolute way. He's in existence back there. The thing about that river of time is that it's completely invisible. Do, do you ever see time itself? You don't see time itself. You see, on the short term, you see my head moving. If you came back in a year's time, you would see slightly less hairs on my head. <laughs> Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. Newton said time is a river. It flows. And Einstein describes time as relative. It all depends on how and where we measure it. And quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics, as it was put together in the 20s by people like Schrodinger and Heisenberg and so forth, says very clearly that time never reaches an end and it never had a beginning. It just goes on forever and ever and ever. Unlike general relativity that says there's a singular big bang, quantum mechanics says the universe just chugs on forever. We never fully sort of grasp exactly what time means to us and I think that's why we carry on being, being obsessed with time and particularly this, this feeling of it you know, slipping through our fingertips. If you read Shakespeare, all he does is tell you what the effects of time 
When forty winters shall besiege thy brow and dig deep trenches in thy beauty's field. <laughs> that's the evidence that time has passed, and that's all the evidence we have of time. Okay, I get it. I can see movement, notice change, so that means I experience time. Or at least I think I do most of the time. But I still don't know exactly what time is. Time is actually not that mysterious. It's just a label. It says that if you're here and now, you have a certain time, a certain location in space. And we can extend that throughout the whole universe. Time is like a little parameter that chunks along, telling us how the universe evolves. Right. Time measures our life and the life of the universe. Yet even our greatest physicists seem confused by time's very existence. And as Einstein said, time is an illusion. It's a, it's a persistently stubborn illusion, but it's nevertheless an illusion. I think that time exists. What does it mean for something to exist in physics? It means that this concept plays an absolutely central role in some accurate, faithful, reliable description of the universe. And who can say that time does not exactly fit that bill? Physicists will argue about whether time exists and whether there is any such thing. So, but there is, if you like, a thing you could call out there of, of, of real time. But the way that we perceive it is very different and can vary. And this is why time can warp and play strange tricks on us. And sometimes it feels as though it's going fast. Sometimes it feels as though it's going slowly. And it can often surprise us. And it carries on playing tricks on us. We, we never quite get used to it. And the reason is that we construct our own conception of time. We, we construct how time feels in our minds. It is based on something out there, but we're constantly constructing the perception of time for ourselves. If we create the concept of time, can we also use it to measure eternity? One of the paradoxes about the relationship between time and eternity is that um, eternity can be seen as one eternal infinite moment because um, many Christian mystics who have had profoundly spiritual experiences, which they claim to, to be experiences of what it, there is but to be on this world, speak of an eternal now moment. Et eternity is eternal time, infinite time, or it can be a timeless state. And some people say that God has the second sort of eternity, God is outside the time, uh, outside all time. And that leads to the apparent conclusion that God doesn't know what time it is now. <laughs> and God's not the only one. Imagine keeping track of time in the vast vacuum of outer space. Second down, 850, you're looking good. Three feet per second, contact now. Is stop. Auto, auto. We're on the, the whole point was, uh, well, we were just a timeline, get the job done. Uh, getting out, out of the spacecraft, onto the surface, and a checklist on one hand, on one wrist, and uh, a watch on the other. Getting your balance, feeling, okay, this is what it looks like. You gawked at it, you said, wow, look at that, and then get back to work. So we were up against the clock, always. Will the sole outcome of mankind's exploration of space be nothing more than an accumulation of scientific data? Or will Edgar Mitchell find something far more personal when he finally has time to gaze into the star-filled heavens? If space is truly the final frontier, then cosmologists are its intrepid explorers, physicists, engineers and astronomers whose wild speculations, complex theories, and dramatic discoveries keep forcing us to reevaluate our place in the universe. As we get better equipment that allows human beings to peer farther and farther out in the universe, to calculate uh, not just distances, but to think through the implications of these vast distances of an, and, and of an eternally expanding universe. Eternity has no place. My favorite theory is that 
eternity is real, that the universe does last forever, it is an implication of that belief that there are probably an infinite number of things that can happen in the universe. So we live in a restless universe, I believe, one that never stops, that never sort of reaches its you know, destination, that is always changing and evolving. Eternity is, is just a cosmic concept, not a personal one. The, the human self becomes no different from that rock over there or the goat that's climbing up the mountainside. You're just part of the, the whole thing and you come into existence and you disappear like everything else. We're not small. People think we're specks we're so, because they're only looking out into the big universe, but they're not looking inward into themselves and into their cells and then into the atoms that are making up their cells. And if you look down into the small sizes, you find that you are the fulcrum of the universe. That I think is amazing. Amazing indeed. A universe infinitely tiny as it is infinitely large, from protons, hadrons, quarks, to dark matter, dark energy, eternal inflation. Are these just theories? Or are we watching eternity evolve after centuries of deep, heartfelt conviction into provable fact? Eternity is, is an eminently scientific concept. It's this block universe. It's this frozen landscape where now is here, uh, the past is that way, and the, and the future is that way, and it all exists timelessly. But that's not the, the poet's notion of eternity. The poet's notion of eternity is the Henry Vaughan poem, um, I saw eternity the other night. It was a great ring of pure endless light. It's something numinous. It's something that you, you see in a vision. And in this vision, you imagine yourself being absorbed into eternity. And uh, you know, finally, you know, that your soul, which has been trapped in time and trapped in matter, is, is liberated and you can see everything from a, you know, kind of a godlike, timeless perspective. Which brings us to the question that probably matters most to the layperson. In this gloriously expanding 21st century, eternal or not universe, what's happened to God? I think that God was a great idea. It was a perfectly respectable hypothesis back when we didn't understand how the universe worked as well. Since, you know, the last 500 years, we've had a succession of discoveries that make it easy to understand how the universe could have existed without God, how life could have evolved without God, how we can think and be conscious without God, and the usefulness of God has been pushed to the outskirts. What I think is that God is an emergent phenomenon that has come from us. And you may ask from what part of us, from what aspect of us. It's from our aspirations. If you start visualizing God this way, as an emerging, emerging phenomenon, always emerging, then whenever you're thinking about God, you are automatically in touch with the real universe. Because this God is by definition consistent with everything science ever has learned and ever will learn. In fact, it is the motivation of science. If the nature of our belief in God is evolving, are we also reassessing the possibility of our own immortality? Strangely enough, the one example of an earthly life form achieving a close approximation of biological immortality is the jellyfish. One species in particular can regenerate itself almost indefinitely, which means for all intents and purposes, it lasts forever. Can we? And do we really want to? If something goes on everlastingly, to, you know, to, uh, eternally, we'll say loosely, um, that you're going to eventually re start repeating yourself, and you'll repeat yourself over and over and over again. Um, and uh, that'll get tedious very quickly. If you gave someone a few extra years, maybe they'd go to the bookshop and buy the book of thousand things to see before you die. Well, okay, you see those, but you're still alive. Then what? You go back to the bookshop, buy the, the book of the next thousand best things to see before you die. Ultimately, if you're living forever, you end up with a thousand things that really aren't worth seeing at all. As writer Stephen Cave sees it, there are four great stories we humans tell ourselves about how to achieve eternal existence. We can medically, physically stay alive. We can be resurrected. We can live on in a bodiless soul. Or we can leave a lasting legacy, our children perhaps, or great works of art. 
Well, the Greeks had a very clear idea of this. We, they said, are like leaves on the tree of life and each generation falls and is over and rots away, and that's it. Culture, on the other hand, has permanence, solidity. That culture is something for eternity. To be sung about by the bards, that was their greatest goal. To be carved as a statue of bronze or of stone, that was real permanence. And on the other hand, we have to ask just how permanent it is. Uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, the poet, expressed this wonderfully in his poem Ozymandias, where the lonely traveller finds this broken, fallen down statue of some great king who clearly thought that he would have this eternal presence and the statue is now lying broken in the dust. Ultimately, that is all of our fates. Humans will almost certainly disappear from the planet one day. The earth will be swallowed up by the sun. It will all have an end. And so permanence really is an illusion. So I think that immortality is just a, you know, um, a distraction. It really is. You know, immortality, eternity on the human scales is not what we should be thinking about. It's extending the real human lives from 100 years to 1,000 years to 10,000 years you know, and making those lives more worth living. You know, we don't, we've done a, a terrible job of giving real human beings here on Earth adequate living environments. Uh, so thinking about eternity is just not something that I think is a fruitful way forward. If traditional stories of eternity often seem to contradict our expanding knowledge of the universe and cause some people to question their faith, then what can we do with our natural longing for something more? something beyond our own finite lives. You can always understand the universe in terms of what you want it to be like. You can always tell a story that fits uh, that preconception that you want to have. Or you can literally take the universe at its own word. You can open yourself to really what the universe is trying to tell you. And I think this is very hard. It's hard for me, it's hard for anybody, right? Because we're not blank slates. We all, you know, go into the world with preconceptions. My concept of eternity is a great big red herring to prevent us looking at this life. That's really the truth. Because the biblical tradition that I've spent my life working with really talks about this life. And when it talks about the other life, or the next life, it's what life should be like on Earth when it becomes a just place. Now, if we spend those moments worrying about the past, or worrying about the future, worrying about death, dreaming of some eternity or immortality that might come, then we're wasting those moments. If instead we try to appreciate each one, then we can have eternity now. And the great philosopher Leibniz, my great hero, he said that, you know, we live in the best of all possible worlds. Leibniz has this very beautiful image of when we're not actually on the coast of the sea, the seashore, but we're, say, half a mile away. We hear the distant sounds of the waves breaking, and it's just a gentle sort of, sort of noise. You know what it's like when you hear the waves breaking from a distance. So I think his image of our sense of eternity is that just that picking up of that distant breaking of the waves as a sort of slight background noise. Rather magical. Eternity's just a... there. Right? And it's equally there in the big sense and equally there in the infinitesimal sense. You can see your life as being like a book. Your life is bounded by birth and death. People are often afraid of what happens after death. But now you imagine in a book, the characters of the book, their lives are also bounded by the front cover and the back cover, but they don't worry about what happened before or after. So, you know, that um, great ice cream cone, that nice 16-year-old single malt scotch, that moment, yeah, that could, that could be it. If you approach it the right way, it can be. Your life, too, is only the moments that happen between birth and death. It doesn't make sense to be afraid of anything outside of that, even when the covers are closed. Long John Silver isn't afraid of reaching the last page of Treasure Island, and we don't need to be afraid of reaching our last page either. And when that book is closed, then that story remains as it has been for eternity. Eternity does not mean stillness. 
The trick is to get used to things being temporary, the fact that things pass, like the transient art some Buddhists make. Being alive means constant change, and even after life seems complete, there is always motion. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. This is the other What a liftoff. And liftoff. We were on our way home. Most of the most of our tasks had been completed, and me in particular, I was simply a, a systems engineer on a well-functioning spacecraft coming home, and uh, could, had a little more time to look out the window. We still had work to do and experiments to do, but by and large, the major part of my job had been completed on the surface, because we were outside the Earth's atmosphere. The stars and the heavens are 10 times as bright as ever could see on Earth, uh, even on the blackest night on the highest mountain. And uh, very colorful, billions of stars and uh, galaxies and galactic clusters. And every two minutes as we rotated, the Earth, the Moon, the Sun uh, came through the spacecraft window. It was an overwhelmingly beautiful, powerful experience what I was feeling was a sense of ecstasy, a sense of oneness. I was really looking at this panorama of stars and the heavens and being overwhelmed and realizing that we really didn't know the real deep questions about who we are, how do we get here, where are we going, and what is this all about? And that the story of ourselves is told by uh, our traditions clearly was incomplete and flawed. And the story of ourselves as told by our best science was still incomplete and perhaps flawed. And that maybe the thing we needed to focus on now was to, now that we had new tools to look at the heavens and better ways to look at it, to refocus on these deep issues. We come along with new ideas all the time and new approaches to things that we've never heard of. It's right out of the blue. And I think that process will continue to go on and on and on. And eventually, that's what eternity is. <laughs>